All right, so <clears throat> we talk about the uh, uh, barcode, QR code, and also RFID, and you know the biggest concern about them is the barcode are definitely cheaper. Cheaper technology is very easy to deploy that, uh, but uh, the read efficiency is not as good as RFID. You have to do this one-to-one -one, uh, information retrieval. But for RFID, you can just use one reader and read a whole bunch of data. So talking about the application, um, RFID uh, are actually uh, are widely used for the toll road. Uh, for example, text tag or what's the name of the U, uh, the Florida tag? Kind of forgot. Sun Pass, right? So that actually uh, just a sticker, and you have the uh, chips and antenna built in. Uh, actually, there are some very interesting video on YouTube. You can find. Um, you can actually make your own. RFID tag, so make your own RFID tag. Um, it's actually just uh, building this antenna and also you can buy the, the chips um, online and it can basically store whatever information and it, it's just building the antenna as well as the chip. So there are so many videos online, I wouldn't play them uh, that you can write in the information and build your own uh, RFID tag. Uh, but people are also concerned about this. Uh, uh, it can be used for domestic surveillance, you know, because, you know, if I can read your information, your vehicle information, then it's, it's possible that I can read your personal information from RFID. In fact, one company is actually doing that. Um, let me see. It's probably here. Yes. Actually, one company built this kind of RFID system and implanted that in the arm of their employee. I love this big board. Oh, topic. yeah. Let me see. Share. Lost. All right. Oh, yeah. It's a <laughs> big move at an office that could change the way a lot of Americans work. A tech company in Wisconsin is offering to implant implant tiny microchips into its employees. Not just no, but no. The chips, <laughs> the chips could allow people to unlock office doors, uh, make purchases. Rebecca, come on here. We, so many questions about this, Robin so and many. Michael. Good morning. We asked a lot of them. This is the first American company to ever try this. One week from today, many of the employees, including the CEO, will voluntarily have the microchips implanted into their bodies. And they're calling it, I'm not kidding here, a chips and salsa party. Oh. <laughs> this morning, like a scene straight out of 007. So you can keep an eye on me? Employees at one Wisconsin tech company, Three Square Market, willingly making that fantasy a reality, implanting their own bodies with microchips. What did the employees say when you brought this idea to them? Half of them actually within five seconds says yes. CEO Todd Westby, along with 50 of his 80 colleagues, even his wife and kids preparing to implant these chips the size of a grain of rice between their forefingers and thumbs so they can do everything from buy snacks in the break room to log in in the morning to unlocking doors with just the swipe of a hand. What did it take to persuade the holdouts? Basically, we had to explain to them there's no uh, tracking of the information. It's not GPS or anything like that. The radio frequency technology in the devices approved by the FDA will be inserted with a small needle by a licensed technician. Some internet experts warn that the convenience could come at a cost. Many things start off with the best of intentions, but sometimes intentions turn. We've survived thousands of years as a species without being microchipped. Is there any particular need to do it now? Participation is optional, and some are holding out. There's always the fear of infection, so it's the unknown right now. But many are excited to give the new technology a try. I think it's kind of cool. Just pop it up there and it'll work. <laughs> Just pop it okay. up there. It's that simple. So to give you a sense, here's a grain of rice. The chips will be inserted like this grain of rice right here. They call it small needle. Did you see that? All right, so it's crazy. But you know, in in the in the 
in the news, uh, they say this is nothing about the GPS, but it can be about GPS. Actually, uh, there are new technologies using FID to localize your position. So we will talk about it in a moment. But anyway, you know, FID can be used uh, for manufacturing um, and to track the locations and the status of the raw materials and the major equipment can be used in a grocery store. For example, like a Walmart, they actually apply FID technologies um, and they found uh, in 2013, just in 2013, they lost $3 billion just due to out of stock. Like you, you go to a store, Walmart store, and you want to buy something, but it's out of stock and pretty much you will give up. Uh, then this, they use the FID technology and they help to reduce the out of store loss by about one third. So that's great progress. And I don't know if you guys saw that a kind of robot in Walmart nowadays. There are some moving robots and that's actually a camera with some kind of uh, intelligent pass planning system and a warden system. It is also used to check the out of stock thing. It basically take pictures, high resolution pictures of the shelf and, um, and the tail uh, and make, make predictions of what products are more popular and also to, to tell the system uh, to replenish. So let me see if I can find that. It's really interesting. Where are my robot? Actually, uh, I have Joe Biden here in tried the... to cut Social Security and Medicare for decades. When I argued that we should Sorry, freeze guys. federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. It could be a game changer for retail. KPI X5's Kid Doe shows us artificial intelligence will soon be put to work at Walmart stores around the country. For a glimpse of the future of retail, we head to Walmart in Milpitas. The company is launching a small army of autonomous. Yeah, you guys uh, can see this uh, in the Walmart in, uh, so in Gunsville. It's about six feet tall, equipped with an array of lights, cameras, and radar sensors. It goes up and down each aisle on its own, about two to three miles per hour, scanning the shelves for empty spots and also checks the price tags. Because the robot uses LiDAR and other video cameras, what it actually sees is very similar to what self-driving cars see. The three-dimensional world it sees is detailed enough for the algorithm to figure out what's missing and needs restocking. And when an employee standing on a ladder gets in view of the camera, yeah, it'll scan that too. Do you feel like a proud papa? <laughs> <laughs> Martin Hitch is the chief business officer at Bossa Nova based in San Francisco, the company that made the robot. He says it's supposed to drive around obstacles and look for alternative routes. We boxed it in with four TV cameras earlier and it made a decision on the fly as to how to figure out a way around so that it could carry on with its job. That's the most rewarding thing. The robot can scan an aisle in about 90 seconds. That's a fraction of the time it would take a human to do the same job. It doesn't get bored, distracted, and presumably doesn't make mistakes. The goal? Fewer empty shelves and better selection. Walmart is testing the robot in 50 stores across four states. Wow, so is that taking somebody's job? It's not taking somebody's job. It's, it's designed to improve the job. Deborah Espinoza is skeptical. She works at San Jose International Airport and says when automated checkout was introduced there, cashiers were laid off. Uh, Walmart says that they are freeing up their associates to provide better customer service. You buy that? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Walmart says it's still too early to say how the robots will impact their workforce. Because technology changes the types of jobs that we have, but nothing will replace um, customer service and human interaction and being with other people and being serviced by a human. Yeah, that's why they are talking about how to make AI human-like. Actually, that's a very hot topic today called a human-like AI. Uh, I attended a CES show in January this year in Las Vegas. Do you guys heard about a CES show? Consumer Electronics Show is the biggest, world number one show showing all the amazing new, like uh, new cell phones, new TVs, new robots, new 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 everything. Uh, actually, they they have this uh, CES 2020 human like. All right, let me show you this. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to find the best. Yeah, here it is. Now, get two iPhone 11s for just $5 per month. One for you and another to share. Only at Verizon. The stronger lasts longer. Energizer Max. 
Neon's artificial human avatar. Okay, so here, let me start here for a moment. You know, I, w my students, my graduate students and I attended the CIS show. We were invited to, to demonstrate our virtual reality system there. Uh, and we, we observed a lot of amaz amazing technologies such as the robots can, you know, play ping pong, uh, table tennis with you, the driverless car and the naked eye 3D models, you know, the latest uh, foldable phones, whatever. And we saw this boring corner and just basically just playing, you know, some, some video chat thing. Like, you know, I saw people talking to, you know, the one-to-one -one people on the screen all day. So we think, oh, why, why CIS invited this kind of a video chat thing to the show? Until the last day we learned that they were not real human beings. They were computer generated AI. They look like real humans. They, they behave like humans, they speak like humans, but they're artificial intelligence. They represent non-existent human beings. These avatars were the viral hit this of guys. CES before the show had even begun. It had everything the internet needed to drive itself into a frenzy. Giant corporate backing courtesy of Samsung, futuristic sci-fi avatars that look like humans, and a huge dose of confusion. <laughs> Redditors combed over the internet for more details about Neon and these futuristic artificial humans. YouTuber Good Content managed to put together a surprisingly detailed dossier on a company that hasn't even existed more than half a year. And so Neon announced itself to the world in a press release heavy on machine learning jargon, a opaque mission statement, and an awful lot of hyperbole. According to Neon creator and Star Labs boss Prinav Mystery, Neons will integrate with our world and serve as new links to a better future, a world where humans are humans and machines are humane. They're envisioned as digital conversation partners where interactions would be a lot more like how you interact with other humans. The mission seems to be a softer, more empathetic connection with our future digital assistants, which sounds nice. But how does it all work? Well, it's actually quite difficult to untangle, and believe me, I've tried. Neon is both the name of the company and the name of the digital avatars we saw here at CES. And they're composed of two different types of technology. First up, we have Core R3, which stands for Reality Real-Time Responsive. Now, this is responsible for how these avatars are looking and how the gestures and interactions are represented. It combines proprietary technology with neural networks to create these avatars that seem almost human. Do you guys believe that? These are not real human beings. They are computer-generated avatars. And actually, I didn't believe that until they showed, and they captured your motion, and your facial expression, and that projected to those avatars in real time. Now I start to believe. Anyway, so, and also the conversation, everything, they are not hiring like 20 people behind a screen and talking to you, no. You talk to them, ask them questions, it's so natural. So if you haven't ever heard about CIS, I definitely ask you to, you know, to just follow that. You know, this is the world largest uh, electronic show. Like this one, you see the screen, that's all curved screens divided by Samsung. And they made like this kind of a curved wall, giant walls. It's, it's amazing, like this one, yeah. So that's actually um, the screens. That's CIS show, you know. Anyway, so yeah, that video talks about, yeah, I don't think AI can replace human, the human to human interaction is still valuable. Unfortunately, those smart people from computer science, engineering, they're already making AI that is so human-like, it's happening. Okay, so that's RFID, and also RFID can be applied definitely in healthcare, um, like the smart band that we are using, that's actually negative, uh, passive RFID, that is stored patient information, uh, smartphone, right? So we have the payment, we have chips built in, in the, in the phone and the smartwatch uh, with chips. And by the way, FID can also be used as GPS system. So one thing is, you know, FID can become the receiver of the GPS signal from the satellite. So it can uh, basically imagine this is kind of like some small GPS device that are tracking everything. So that company is saying that, oh, we're not tracking a GPS, they are lying. Oh, maybe they were not, but now it's possible. And also uh, there's a new method, very smart method that how to triangulate um, the position using RFID. So I'm just going to share this thing quickly. You guys see this one? See my white, white boat, right? So let's say you have this uh, satellite. Okay, it's ugly and it was on ground, you have some RFID chips, 
And so basically now I see I have this uh, three, three RFID chips. What it does is, you know, if I just have one station here and basically read the signal, you know how GPS works. So basically you have, let's say two satellite and the, the satellite will, will send the information. So this is more kind of like a passive system. They will send the, uh, some signal to this uh, GPS tracker and the GPS tracker will uh, return that back to the satellite, right? And by calculate the data, and we know, you know, the X, Y, Z difference between the two, you know, uh, between the two satellite. So if we calculate the time difference, we can basically just triangulate X, Y, Z of this station. Make sense? Okay, so what that is a smart way of doing that? How do I change the color of the pen? Sorry guys, I don't know how to change the color of this pen. Anyway, so, um, so we have this XYZ. Now these are all RFID chips. So RFID. 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 So that smart method, it was, they basically connect all the RFID as a network, all right? And they all talk to the same GPS ground station and they calculate each of the delta here. And they also triangulate each other, correct each other. So the more RFID chip you have, the more accurate, you, the more precise, you can track the X, Y, Z of each RFID chip. Make sense? So it's actually having this kind of RFID GPS system. It's kind of like you have a GPS system here and you have the location of this ground station and the ground station is talking to the network of RFID uh, tags. And then basically the, the X, Y, Z will be identified for each of the tag. So can RFID track GPS? The answer is definitely yes. Make sense? All right, so of course RFID can be used uh, uh, to, as, as a solution for internet of things. Let me check you. Oh. Your next refrigerator. Oh, I think we'll talk about that. Okay. And uh, so the first off I use, by the way, in the construction was in 1995, published by Edward Jasowski. At that time, I think he was with Iowa State University. Now he's a professor at North Carolina State University. So basically talk about how FID can be used in construction to track the equipment, track the materials. So talking about the potential FID, I call this uh, M3 or M square, you know, uh, problem, uh, the management of materials, the management of machinery, and the management of man. Um, RFID can actually be used to, let's say, for the materials, can be applied to improve the supply chain, logistics, QA, QC, quality assurance, quality checking, inventory management, waste management, for example. And for machinery, we can track the location of the machines, the status, if they're idle, if they're working. Uh, we can check in if the operations are correct, you know, if they're within the confined area, constrained areas. Um, and also we can check, you know, in terms of the maintenance, uh, how frequent we should give the maintenance is the automated logging system. And for the management domain, you know, we can basically do the access control, the gating system, and we can check their attendance. And of course, we can use RFID GPS location uh, method to check the safety, for example, uh, if they're entering a dangerous area, a crowded area, those kind of stuff. Okay, so here it talks about some potential applications of FID in construction. This is striking. The oil and gas industry is the backbone of the American economy, connected throughout the land by miles upon endless miles of pipe. With all that's riding on the integrity of these pipes and the pipelines they make up, there must be a better solution to track, maintain, and control the information associated with each length of pipe. Well, now there's a solution. Radio Frequency ID, RFID. Now companies can meet tracking requirements for FERC and FEMSA compliance and provide better asset management for improved safety, maintenance, and compliance. RFID. It's used every day in a variety of industries, ranging from access control, toll roads, 
asset and livestock tracking, and even air passenger baggage. It's secure and allows greater control of sensitive data or proprietary information. Each tag operates with specific parameters and radio frequency bands enhancing security. Industry and government compliance requirements have never been greater. The old standby grease pencil and clipboard tracking is subject to human error. RFID solves that problem by eliminating guesswork and lost pipe. With our system, it's never been easier or more efficient to automate the collection of safety data, updates, and certification. See, this is how the read information. If this is barcode, it will take forever. But RFID just and now tell me, is this passive or active? Passive. Passive, yeah, definitely. We're talking about material tracking. We don't have the cost to cover that much, and we do not need active. Capture data that's accurate as it can be. It allows for easy and customized reporting. Track maintenance with all the specifications with our system. RFID is unique to each pipe with breakthrough technology, never before used in the oil and gas industry. With Pipeline Track, you now have a solution for tracking, data management, reporting, and shrinkage. Would that be of value to you? Pipeline Track is the leader in this new technology and can assist anyone needing to sell, track, or maintain oil and gas pipeline materials and equipment. Here's how it works. Each pipe is tagged with a radio frequency tracking device. At the same time, the description and specifications for each tagged pipe is collected and recorded. When this device is scanned either by handheld or fixed readers, it uniquely identifies that specific piece of pipe and where it is, even providing GPS coordinates. Imagine a vehicle passing through a toll booth at a high speed as opposed to stopping and waiting in line to pay. Information for that piece of pipe is then automatically recorded and maintained. So whether you walk a pipe yard with a handheld device or have a truckload of pipe that you drive past a scanner, it's simply the most efficient method for today's oil and gas needs. Contact Pipeline Track today and make your pipe concerns a competitive asset. Find out for yourself how easy it is to control your pipe data, reporting and maintenance. What is the peace of mind that Pipeline Track provides work to you and your company? By the way, guys, I just noticed that I know GPL, you know, uh, they are in, in Houston and I, I miss Texas. So um, do you know why pipeline is so important for oil and gas, oil and gas industry and also for industrial projects? Because it represents about 40% of total labor hours. I'm not talking about the product cost. Um, so one thing you guys have to know is Product cost in terms of dollars and the product effort in terms of labor hours, there are different concepts. For example, if you're building a power plant, the most expensive components could be the turbines, the generators. But a, a matter of installing them could just cost you know cost you about one month to do it. Make sense? But for a six-year project, maybe you're spending more time on, for example, pipe feeding, like connecting the pipes. But the pipes, the material cost, they are probably lower. Um, so what's more important to a project? My personal opinion is labor hours because our product, our industry is a labor intensive industry and humans always commit errors. So when you are having trouble, very likely is the trouble created by your laborers, by your workers. So as a product manager, as a decision maker, you have to pay special attention to the laborers, not just the maturity, right? So that's also I, what I saw when I was working in the industry. When they evaluate the progress of a project, they don't use the dollar as the evaluation method, use the labor hours. Let's say to finish the entire project, we need 1 million labor hours. And we are about 500,000 down, which means 50% down. They are not using the installed the dollar values of the project, make sense? And so pipeline represent about 40% of the labor hours. So that's why the oil and the gas industry and the industrial projects such as power plant, nuclear plant, factories, they pay special attention to how to improve the efficiency of pipeline works. All right, make sense guys? Okay, so let me check what the other one is. The ideas expressed. Hey, that's too much. Okay, so you guys know this is a concrete, oh yeah, this is a very interesting one. Let me find this one. 
this guy, they basically build this uh, RFID chip and they uh, mix that in the concrete. So they can basically track the curing process of the concrete automatically. There's no wires, no batteries, cheap. That's what we're looking for. And we're going to modify this sensor. We're going to add a sensing wire. Okay? And we're also going to protect the actual brain here. Put a container around it. So we have this sensing wire on the outside. This sensing wire could sense anything. We'll talk more about that coming up, but we're going to first go after chlorides. Okay? So we're going to make it the same chemistry as rebar. And what's going to happen is when that, rebar, when that wire breaks, right? Uh, you know, corrosion, the sensor can tell and it changes its name. So it can respond, the wire is there, and it can respond, the wire is missing, the wire is broken, those two things. Prototype sensors, are, they're about the size of a quarter, okay? You can see it there. You can see this copper coil around the outside, and this is the sensing wire right here, and this is the final one. This is the uh, production sensor, and there's actually two different wires on it, and it's orange because all things good in life are orange, right? Go Cowboys, okay? That's what it looks like. Again, the size of a quarter. Now we're going to put our sensor in the cover, in the area between the rebar and the surface. So this sensor doesn't measure corrosion of the steel. I'll say it again. It doesn't measure corrosion of the steel. It's a warning. It tells you the chlorides are coming. Watch out. The chlorides are coming. You could put these at multiple depths if you wanted to. You could actually use a ladder if you wanted to of different sensing elements so it'll trip over time, let you know, oh, it's at this depth, it's at this depth. So as the chlorides come in and they actually go on the surface, when they get to the level of the sensor, the wire breaks, okay? The wire breaks and it tells you the chlorides are coming. So let's benchmark these sensors to show that they work. We're going to take some Ziploc containers. We're going to bury the sensor in them at a known depth. We're going to screed our sample at a known height, so the distance between the surface and our sensor wire is extremely well known. Okay? And we're going to put chlorides on top of it after it's you know, hardened. We're going to put uh, uh, some sealer around the outside. We're going to lid it. We're going to put it inside a, 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 an oven, speed up diffusion. We're going to let it rip, see what happens. We take, it sensor out, se take the element out and measure it, put it back in measure it again and again and again. We actually wouldn't even have to do that. We could just scan the entire oven and get the data out of it, okay? But we don't do that. We, we take it in and out. Once it's done, once it trips, we're going to do a bulk diffusion test on it. We're going to basically do a, a, a chloride profile on it. And we're going to drill out the powder, okay? You can see it going in. So we get down to the sensor, and we're going to compare the concentration on the y-axis versus the depth on the x-axis. Now I'm showing two sets of data here of sensors at different depths inside the concrete with different thicknesses of sensing wires. The good takeaway from this is it's, re it's reproducible, okay? It's reproducible and it gives you some signal, some idea that the chlorides are coming. So how do we make All right, I think you guys have a sense that sensors can also be embedded and we can use them in a smart way. All right guys, so now we covered the sensors, so I guess you guys should have a pretty good sense like how sensors can be used in uh, uh, civil engineering industry to promote structural uh, performance, construction performance, safety, and also for the management, like inventory management, uh, tracking. Uh, now it's your turn, you know, for your third team assignment, you, you need to think about some creative way to redesign the well hall building to serve some functions such as the wayfinding, navigation. Um, that is your third assignment. So now let's talk about the second one, the app thing, okay? So before we talk about um, how to build it, let me show uh, something I just did quickly today uh, for the class demo. All right, you see this, um, I don't know how to show my screen better. Hey, have, I ever, have any of you uh, ever tried to share the screen from a phone? Is that possible? Uh, yeah, it's possible. Okay, let me, let me see that. Let me try that. Zoom, waiting, use camera, do not allow. Um, always video preview. 
without a video. Okay, share content. Should I just share screen or share full of screen, right? Every single screen, including the figure. Start. Can you guys see my screen now? No? This is this is difficult. Um, Maybe Doctor Du, uh, you might uh, first stop sharing with the computer. Okay, I think I. Oh, I need to stop sharing first. I see. Stop sharing this one. And uh, okay, let me rejoin the meeting. Just give me a second. So I'm joining this one with my phone. We do not need the video. So now you see this uh, I come in, cancel, and um, just share the cloud. Yeah, so here's the thing. I can share screen, photos, iPhone, uh, iCloud, Dropbox. Should I just say screen? So when I say screen, it shows that everything, it just allows me to screen broadcast. Nothing there. Oh, great. Now, now you guys can see my screen, right? Okay, great. So this is my phone. You know, I know it's slow because sharing, but let's just check what the, what the, you know, what I can do. This is an inventory management app. So you can see all the inventory I already built in, but I can just click this add, and then I can basically put some you know, like uh, numbers, I see 250 for my equipment ID and I name, I can name it whatever, let's say uh, tabler. And you can be, I can basically select the category, you know, it can be text, you know, I see 555. The standard shows how healthy, the healthy condition, it looks pretty new. Uh, and also I can take a, a picture of that. So let's take a picture. Okay, so this is, I said this is the inventory. So I'm going to take a picture of this. Is that? Is that frozen? Yes. Okay. It just shows I need to redraw on the meeting. It's frozen, but here it shows it's normal. Coming back. Okay, so see, I just took that picture. Now you see this picture, and I can put some notes. The best stabler. And I have this uh, QR reader. I already made this QR uh, code for, for my phone. So we just read it very quickly. And also, I can document the GPS of this uh, particular equipment very, very fast, right? I can also put the dollar. One thousand dollars, and I can just click save. And once it's saved, and let me see where's that. Yeah, it's here. See, 
basically I have all the information here, right? And I can just add another one. Let's see. Uh, equipment, whatever, 6777, whatever, category 233. Uh, it's in really bad condition. I can just take a photo of that once again. I think it, uh, it freezes again. Anyway, you guys got the sense. So um, let me stop sharing this one. And the beauty of this is, let me stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Like this. And start to share my screen. Okay, you guys can see my computer screen right now, right? No. Okay. Y yes or no? Yes. No? Yes, okay. See, you know, it, this is a Google Sheet and whatever I documented, the stapler, inventory, barcode, everything actually automatically, automatically saves here. And if I go to my uh, folder, there's a inventory image. And you will see also it has the image I just, I just took. So everything has happened so fast. You guys, you guys understood what happened, right? I just have this, uh, I built this, uh, I built this uh, phone app just today. Okay, I built this phone app just today and it has the function, it can also show calendar. I can basically document like how many uh, equipment need be, need be maintained or checked on a daily basis. It also has the GPS, you know, I just document the one thing so you can see this is uh, uh, the well hall and where's the other. Um, so it basically document GPS and also um, you can check what's going on. And if you want to uh, edit something, uh, you can just uh, left slide it to delete things and I can right select to edit that. So very smart phone app. I'm gonna teach you how to do it. Very simple, okay? So now you guys can see my screen, right? All right. So this is something called AppSheet. It's a easier proof smartphone app, uh, you know, builder based on Google Sheet or whatever Dropbox. So you just go there and you just basically sign in. Um, I already sent in, so you can click stop for free to, to log in, it's, it's free for you to use. Of course, with limited um, functions. Let me just restart that app sheet and go app sheet and go log in since I already have a account and I already logged in. So I just go to my, my apps, all right? Okay, so now let's create a new app from Nothing. Okay, so we want to use, there are different options, but we want to use this one, start with your own data and go here. You can name it, let's say, um, class demo, CGN 16.5 demo 2020, all right? And you can also select a category. You know, when you have many, many apps, you want to use the, you know, the category to find them. And also when you publish app, you, you can opt in to share your app with others. So let's say we want to do an inspection of the survey app and then you select true cell data. It will ask you to link to your Google Drive. Since I already did that, you know, when I registered the account, they will ask you to tap in your Gmail account. So since I did that already, it will open this window. This is nothing but my, uh, just you can see this is actually my uh, Google account, you know, App sheet class, everything here, you see the same thing. I created the folder called app sheet. So I want to manage all the, the data that, you know, for my, for my smart app. So now I need to create a new uh, sheet for, to store my information. So this is a database. So just click here on the Google sheet. I'm going to call this one demo inventory. Okay. And then you basically just uh, 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 created some columns. So let me see, I wanna create the first one, it's called the equip ID. And the second one, let's say it's called name. You know, this is the name of the equipment. And I call this category. So is that office, is that a site? Is that whatever maintenance device, the status of that, okay? And let's say I want to have an image of that. I can take a picture, I can make some notes. 
uh, and also I want to do some barcode thing. Okay, so when this is done, you come back to your uh, my apps and find I build that in the app sheet and find the one. So it's demo inventory, right? So let's open that. Then it's analyzing the columns and everything, creating a new app. It shouldn't take this long. All right. So you have this window open. You know, one thing you notice is this, this is the preview of your app. Since we haven't done anything, uh, there's nothing here, but imagine this is the phone. It will be uh, the same on your phone once you deploy that app on your phone. And you also here have the data, the UX. The UX is more the user interface. The behavior is kind of like a define. If I click a button, it will send the email to my email address or if you text somebody. Uh, and also the uh, user, you can basically uh, store manager everything. So when you push some information, they will receive warning or if they are allowed to change the app setting, change the database, manage similarly. Uh, the info is showing the overall view. If you have multiple database, let's say one thing for inventory, one thing for human resource, and you want to assign a person to maintain certain thing and other stuff. So this info will basically show that relationship. But since we only got this one database, you know, called the demo inventory, which is this database. So you will only see this one. So number one thing is let's go to data. And you see this demo inventory already uh, built in. So let's just go columns and open this one. Now you'll see equip ID name, category, everything. That's all the column names I tap here. So basically read that directly from my previous uh, one. So I want to design key. The key means something cannot be repeated. It's unique. And usually we use uh, equipment ID as the key, okay? And we have this name and the name should be, uh, so uh, equipment ID, you know, it can be text, but here we, I want to change it to number. So the tab, you can just use the drop down box and change the type of that. So let's say I want to change this to number. Okay, so that's my equipment ID name, that's name. Category can be text for now, status. Okay, so I wanted to make it easy. So I want to change status to colors so I can have different colors. So I'm going to do the color. Um, and also let's say image, that's image. So it recognized, basically interpret the, the words you type in and try to see, oh, if you type in image, very likely to tap is an image. So it will basically create a folder called image store that. Notes, that's long text, that's fine. Um, barcode, it shows text, right? But then I can drag it here and see these are four columns. Is that a searchable, is that a scannable? Um, you, you do not worry about NFC and the PII. So let's say scannable. Scannable, if you check it, it will become a barcode reader. So since you put the word barcode, this, this uh, application is very smart, it knows you want to scan that, so it is barcode. And uh, let me see, everything should look good. Barcode everything. And you can make this one uh, editable or not. So if you uncheck editable, for example, if I uncheck here, then you wouldn't see that plus button to add new equipment to your inventory. So we want to make it checked. Required means, you know, can I just tap in some name without the equipment ID? You know, if I make this one required, then it must be tapped in. I can also make the status required since my app wants to check the status and everything, okay? So now if this one looks good to you, and then it should be fine. It should be able to tap in some stuff. So let's, let's just check, add something, see? Basically shows all the structure you just tap in. You can play it here, like um, give, give it a default number, right? So it's one shows this number, but we can change it. Let's say one, two, three. And the name is uh, Dozer. And also you can just manually tap the category. Let's say um, that's a site equip. Status. Okay, so it's not on our, on our phone, so you kind of see that. And similarly for image, you know, um, you know, if you're on your phone, if you show that and the barcode reader, 
basically it will basically read, you know, if your phone is barcode. If you save that, okay, so this the point is, let's change it to unrequired and save that. Now you see this, you know, uh, one, and I can, of course, just add more. Let's say 555, whatever, GGG. Okay, I have two entry. And if you go back to this demo inventory, you see it just basically automatically populates the information you tapped in. Make sense? So that's already something that are uh, runnable. Of course, you can design the UX. So let's go design the UX. So, so far it has two tabs. One is the demo inventory here, one is the calendar. So calendar is given by default. So that's why you see the calendar. So you just basically go there and it tells you well, how you want to name um, the, 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 the tab. I don't need the, the name, I need the, the, the name uh, demo in it. So I just basically change it to inventory. Now I see it's the tab changes to inventory. Um, I can decide if uh, the automated show is a table or gallery view. So if I change it to gallery view, then you just see, you know, the gallery view of the, the one or deck or table, just different way to show um, the information. And you can make it, uh, I want it to be the leftmost. All right. And also you can pick um, the image for this tab or whatever. So, but I want to give it a logo. For example, I want to change this logo, the symbol to this. See, then it basically changes that. Uh, similarly, you have this calendar and everything. Okay, so let's add more stuff. Let's go back to the data and go to the column. You say, Hey, you know what? I want to add. Let's see that. Let me undo. Yeah, you know what? I think GPS location is important for this app. I want to add a GPS. So then you just go back and just on your Google Sheet, just tap in GPS. Give it a second, come back, and do what? Just regenerate structure. It means I'm rereading. Are you sure? Yes. Rereading the thing from your Google Sheet. And it basically tells you this, okay? So you see the GPS and the, the tab has been changed to longitudinal and longitudinal, latitudinal and longitudinal. Uh, so that shows the GPS, all right? Um, but there's an arrow showing the status. Let me see. Hmm. Okay, something's wrong with the color thing. That's not the key. Oh, I see. We need to define the color. List. Okay, let me check the, the one that I built already. App sheet. You can, you can see even with a free account, I can build, I don't know how many apps you can build, but I have so many apps I just play with. Let me see what I did to the color. Still there's a, oh, here. Okay, got that. We didn't define color, sorry guys. So see this little pencil? Basically you can define more information for the column, more behaviors. So it also tells you there's something wrong with here. So I just open this one, this is status, the tab is color. Now I can add a value. So I'm going to add this right, add a yellow, add a green. All right, and uh, 
let me save and see. Okay, I need to check what I did to this color here. Oh yes, green everything. I need to use the capital G and capital, okay, capital lighter. All right, then come back, color, right, yellow, green. This text, everything, down. Okay, now it solves the problem. Now, if you see, uh, if I add anything, you see that becomes the color ribbon I can use. So I just because select one thing on my phone, it becomes easier. Makes sense, guys. So basically, you can define more uh, behavior there. So that's the color, and uh, now we also have this GPS. You see, basically, you click this one, it will basically show the GPS, and you save that. And we have a uh, just randomly populated one. And select this right and save. Save. And now I have this, you know, new entry. And if you go there, see, it basically shows the entry as well as the, you know, the right. Okay. Now this is, uh, let me check. We have added that at the GPS. Okay, so now let's add another thing. Let's say for the category, this one, I don't want to manually tap in all the information because my company has a very complex category definition for the equipment. What if I just link that table? So this is about the linking multiple tables in a certain in the same app. Uh, can I do that? Yes. So let me just go back to this folder and I'm going to add another sheet. Uh, create that one and call this demo reference. And I just call this one category. I need to use exactly the same one and I can say all face supply site whip rental uh, computers personal I say my company runs this many thing all right so now let's go back to my app here and uh, let's go back to data. Now see, I only got one data, right? But I can add more table. It's more kind of like adding more uh, data size. So I'm going to click this one and just go Google. It will open the, my Google account and go app sheet. And I want to find the demo reference. Um, I want it to be uh, updatable and add this table. So now you see, just give it a second. Now you see I added this new table, okay? So now let's go to column. You see I have this original demo inventory, but I have this new, uh, because this, the name is sheet one here. So basically it shows uh, the sheet one of this new reference table, okay? So now I want to make change the attribute or the tab of my category from this menu tab, the text to something called a reference. So I just go reference and I click this one, okay? So basically I change the type to reference now to ask you where you want to pull information from the source table. I want to find, oh, I have this one. So sheet one and uh, it looks good. Just go down. Okay, and then let me see. Oh, category. Okay, and then it wants want ask you how do you want to show the information? So maybe I can just show the drop down because if I have many categories, I want it to be a drop down um, box. Just click OK. And now let's save that. All right. So let's try to add a new thing. 8888. Test. See the category? Now it has this. See? It has this, you know. The thing I define, I say this is computer. Oh, I see you, you cannot have space. So we need to get rid of the space here. And let's just down and just come back here. Um, 
here and just regenerate a structure, which means we want to read that again from the Google Sheet. Give it a second. And uh, let's try to do that again. Oh, it's still not there? Yeah, we'll fix that later. So computers here and document, you can put the notes here, take a picture and everything. Okay, your GPS. All right, so you should be able to see that also has the GPS information. Okay, so if it's not synchronized, sometimes it's because the, of the network speed. If you see that number, it means it hasn't been synchronized. If it is gone, then it should be synchronized already, see? Basically, you have the information populated. All right, so let's say um, I'm okay with it. I want to deploy that, but before that, I make uh, other changes for the UI, let's say the brand. Okay, I can make this to uh, dark mode or light mode. You can also select the color you need. Okay, so you know you, you see what's going on here, right? Uh, you can also select the logo for your for your app, or you can design a logo and uh, upload that yourself. So I'm going to use the little horse. Lunch image, you know, uh, when it launches the, the homepage, how it looks like. Um, you can also select a background image. Uh, you want to show the view in the header. So yeah, it shows the inventory view, show the logo. Yeah, it shows the logo. And yeah, you just basically can do a lot of things and just save that, it's saved. All right, so for behavior, you know, this is also very uh, useful. For example, I want, every time when something is marked as right color, I want to send the email to the manager. So I just say email, right, status, I name that as that. And I just say, based on the changes to what uh, table? So based on the changes to my uh, inventory table, uh, and then just do what? You can basically you see here all the actions you can do. So I say external, you can even make a phone call. So I just say start an email to what email address? You just type in the email address. I see uh, eric.do at ic.ufl.edu and go save. All right, subject warning. Of course, you see here, guys, you can, um, you know, here are the tools you can use. For example, you want to create a new table based on the total volume or total value of your equipment. You can use the mass and here you have the functions like a summation and also you can cite what columns I use. So when you do this kind of stuff, you're actually creating a formula here. And it can, let's say if you create a new column and you want to define the behavior of the column, you can basically just say, you know, I want it to be this uh, status, you know, plus something. I'm, I'm just making example, it's not necessarily correct, insert. So you basically can make formula here to define the behavior, right? But here we're just writing an email. So just the message and also the message, pay attention. You can also, you know, link it, you know, equipment ID. Okay, so it treats it as a, we need to make it a text. Yeah, so let's use this one. I'm trying to, yes, so pay attention to this one. And also I can add the time like this. All right, so we have the title, the subject of my email and everything. Um, it's okay, behavior. And I ask you when something is true, do this, right? So when this thing is true here, do this. So we also need to define what that means. So I open this one and just say, uh, I want to get the column, let's say the status, 
when stutter is equals to equals to right and then save. So basically when the, the stutter is equals to, you know, the volume of the column status is equal to right, then send this email and save that. Now you have this behavior. By the way, guys, I tried it earlier this year. It's working, but I tried this morning. It's not working. I don't know. Is that because they changed the policy? You have to purchase their uh, subscription to be able to initiate, to be able to activate a certain function. Um, I don't, I don't know if that is the case or I did something wrong, but if you want to buy this service, it's amazing product. It's only $5 a month. So you can do that. Um, but for this, you know, class project, you just use the free version. That's totally fine. So let me see if it's working now. Let me see, I add this one and uh, try to add something here. Right. Everything okay, save. Okay, so if it's working correctly now, I, I'm supposed to receive an email from that. Unfortunately, I haven't received that. I don't know what's wrong with that, but you guys can figure out and let me know, okay? So now let's say, oh, I also forgot one thing. I have inventory calendar. I also want my GPS show. So then I can go to this uh, UX. I want to add a new view, which is more like adding a new app uh, tab. So I want to go this one and change the one to GPS. Uh, I want it to be um, map. So I change it to a map, okay? And I want this one to be the rightmost. So basically the GPS comes here, calendar is here, inventory is here. Um, map column. So I want it to be read from my GPS data. Okay, so now I just do that. If, of course, you can also read from multiple table. If, you are, you are, if your app uh, talks to multiple data sites, you can also do that. Uh, but I think this is fine. And I want to change this one to uh, a diff, give it a different uh, logo like this and go save. All right, so I think this app should have the basic function I have, then it's not deployed. So I'm just going here. It, uh, it basically compels your app and tell you something, uh, warning or whatever, or color status. Oh, I see, here's why. Um, you, without paying that, um, you cannot deploy that to your phone. I got that. Um, so that's why it shows the account status. You have to purchase the $5 thing. But I, anyway, guys, uh, you are not required to purchase this one for the team assignment. You can always show this small window and treat it as a phone to show the function of that. But I don't think I can deploy that now because of this arrow. But I can share that, you know, like uh, I can put it, uh, you can create a domain, like a, a mailing list of your company employee Oh, you can just manually tap this. Um, hold on. Just add. All right, can I add multiple emails? I'm not a robot. And uh, then just like this. And okay, so then just check your email. Then just check your email. You should receive that this uh, uh, invitation to install uh, this demo and just basically install that. Once again, I don't know if it's working since. Okay, it's working. I guess because I paid. Okay, so now you see this app. Looks good. And just say I want to add a new thing. You see that's basically what we did. Uh, what we did. Let's see. Let me just use the number 999, 9999 and say test, test. Category, I can put this one personal. 
and the status that's green, okay? And uh, uh, image, I can take a picture of my office. All right, use photo, okay, so like this. And then I just say notes, uh, some notes, okay. All right, I have this uh, QR code reader. It's called QR code reader, like this. So I basically put the QR code here and read the QR code and uh, put the, the notes here directly. GPS, I just click GPS, ask you, can I use your location? Yes. And then I have the GPS. All right. Save. Okay. So now I have this new entry. And let's go GPS. I have everything I need. Okay, so this app is working. And then let me go back to my, you guys can still see my screen, right? So demo, you see this is the 999 test, good piece, barcode. And if I go to my um, Google Drive folder, you see this uh, demo inventory images, you open that, you see it also automatically uploads the image I took. So it basically stores all the information I need. All right, so guys, this is a quick uh, view, uh, a tutorial of this app sheet. There are many, similar uh, solutions uh, provide this kind of easier proof smart app development but this app sheet uh, is the one that I think the most of, uh, powerful one that it gives you a lot of functions and very smart. Uh, it was a separate company but not purchased by Google. So that's why you know you create a Google Drive. It works perfect with Google. All right guys so um, I'm just going to stop here. Any question? about this app sheet thing. Um, you can always review the, the video um, and see how it works, okay? So let me open this uh, canvas. Uh, let's confirm the schedule. Okay, once again, guys, according to the original schedule, uh, it is due on October 7th, but since we are we are running late, so let's say we push this uh, app sheet demo to October 14th, and uh, you are going to, each team are going to, to share your screen and show uh, how demo is working and give a very short uh, presentation that uh, your demo, about a demo. So that will be on October 14th. You can use app sheet, but if you discover something else that you think is more convenient, you can also use them. Or if you know, oh, you know what? I know how to develop an iOS app or Android app, then you can, you're, you're more than welcome to do that too. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen and just try to find some app that the previous team developed. Some mission app. Unfortunately, I don't have them here. Why? Oh, I guess I just, uh, yeah, I removed all the previous, you know, uh, submissions. Okay, guys, any, any question about this uh, app sheet, smartphone thing? Um, any question about the homework? No, I guess I'm good. Are you, are you excited with uh, developing some app yourself? Actually, just be creative, be, uh, be imaginative. Uh, most, most teams before, they also did something similar like uh, uh, equipment tracking, everything, which is totally good, which is totally okay. But uh, I recall one team, they somehow figure out a way to link the data to building information model. And they basically created a, uh, the GUID, which is the unique ID for Beam components. They, they printed a lot of uh, uh, QR code and a copy paste on the building. And they just use that app. They basically just scan them. I don't know how they did that. They created, a, so think about that. This, what this app is doing is just to read information from some Google Sheet and write information from Google Sheet. And they also had some add-in in Revit that can read information from a Google Sheet. And then what they did is they just use this one, scan something, and then the information just populates automatically in a Revit model. 
and uh, show things around. So that's amazing. That, that's actually very smart design. Just think about that, what kind of uh, solution you have. And the uh, beauty of this, is, um, let me share my screen. For the share my screen. So the beauty of this uh, app uh, solution is uh, they have this uh, sample apps. You go there and you can see a whole lot of sample apps, different categories. You can definitely, uh, you know, go there and you know you can copy that to your account. They basically you copy the entire structure. Uh, you can basically revise it, edit that, or you can explore that like this one. It basically shows the function that. So basically you can just explore the app first to see if this app is similar to what you are thinking. And if yes, you can just copy and customize the app. They give you, they provided you a whole lot of apps. You can also search, you know, the keyword. And you can, you know, like punch list. Oh, that's actually a very useful app. Just go there and you can use the punch list app. By the way, can anybody tell me what a punch list mean? Anybody? It's a list of uh, activity, or I mean, anything that you have to redo or like rectify in a building. Yes, so before you deliver the final project to the owner, you are going to do a final walkthrough so your project is probably 99% done, but still there are a list of items you have to finish. Like there's some touch up in the paint. Uh, you have to fix some of the joints or the carpet, you know, is broken somewhere. So basically you document where uh, the small fixes need to be done before the final payment to the contract. That's called a punch list. And usually people use something called a blue tape. Have you heard about that? Blue tape no. punch list. That's a manual process. You basically just use a blue tape and uh, uh, like this, you know, it's a blue tape and just uh, put it on where the fix need to happen. That's, that's a punch list. And there are some companies actually using building information model to automate the process. And think about that, you know, this may be some useful thing for you to use the GPS log function um, to uh, automate this blue, two blue tape punch list uh, process. All right, so think about that. This is a group, process, uh, group project, just be smart. And if you have a question, let me know. You can always review the, the video I, I did today. All right, thank you guys. Uh, see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.